Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Greer. This is Dr. Stephen Greer. I'm the uh, founder of eSETI and the Disclosure Project and SeriousDisclosure.com. I'd like to thank the folks at the World Fusion Network for hosting us here every two weeks to uh, bring you uh, updates on our project and also to uh, bring you new information and interesting people. Uh, today we have a really wonderful and interesting uh, man who's uh, worked for many years studying the potential for new energy and has uh, really interesting uh, theories and concepts in physics uh, dealing with uh, a really uh, new type of unified field theory. Uh, and of course, I'm speaking about Nassim Haramin, and he has uh, been involved with this for many years, at least 20 years studying this, and he has founded the uh, Resonance Project Foundation and uh, directs the research for that team of uh, scientists looking into new energy potential. So, uh, Nassim, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Stephen. It's great to be here with you. Um, it's good to be able to talk directly. Yes, indeed. Well, I, 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 we've, we've often uh, kind of crossed paths. You've been in uh, my hometown of Charlottesville when I was somewhere in Europe, and <laughs> yeah. now we, we can do this. So uh, I <laughs> appreciate the opportunity and, and you taking your time. And I guess my, my first thing that I'd like to have you explain to folks is, uh, what, you know, in, in lay terms, understanding most people, listening or not physicists, but uh, your understanding of the potential for uh, so-called over-unity and new energy technology and how those systems might work and where that energy is coming from. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's a, it's a wild, wide field of, uh, of study and, you know, I'm going to try to give a short answer, but I think that um, there is a fundamental, to start with, there's a fundamental concept in physics that's called conservation of energy. That means that energy right. cannot be generated or destroyed, that it's always conserved. Um, information can be described that way as well, meaning that energy and information in physics can be equivalent, so that no information um, uh, can be destroyed. So there's there's all sorts of implications to this, and this is why there's been so much objections to concept of so-called free energy or over unity devices, um, because it's seen um, if on the surface to violate um, conservation laws and. Right. And, and, and because it seems that it would be a device in which uh, energy is, creating out, is created out of nowhere or that it's coming out of, you know, um, in a no known source. Um, and, um, and really that's been a misconception. Uh, and let's back up a little bit, maybe look at um, matter you know, creation in our standard model of the universe. In the current model of the universe, for instance, we have like a, a concept that there was a big bang, a big explosion, uh, and that all matter came out of it um, and expanded from there into the universe we see today. The thing is, is that if you actually follow that model back all the way in time, all the way back to the Big Bang, you still don't have a source for the energy that produced that first event. Right. So, That's right. So even in the standard model, there's a violation of conservation right there. Um, and to me, from early on, um, looking, at, you know, at... And, I, and I'm talking when I was an adolescent and going through physics class and, and chemistry class, looking at matter, looking at atoms, looking at the structure that we call the material world, I, it seemed odd to me uh, right from the beginning that the stuff that we call the material world 
the dense stuff all around us is actually made of 99.9999999% space. So it was, to me, early on a clue that maybe, uh, maybe what we're experiencing as the material world may be just a denser part of the space itself. Right. Um, yeah. And that's well, and and one of the fa- one of the facts that people don't often understand in physics is that if you were to uh, take your your physical body that some people can relate to, um, I'm a, you know a medical doctor, but I've also studied very advanced physics for about 25 years. What you yes. find is that the if you were to take all the space out of the uh, interatomic and intermolecular uh, what we call matter, the, the, the parts of, of atoms that are solid matter that mm-hmm. has mass, and you collapse it into a piece of solid matter, it would, uh, your body, and I'm a you know, six foot four, 225 pound guy, mm-hmm. my body would fit on the, 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 the tip of a pin. It would right. be a little speck, and all the rest, uh, so as you're looking at yourself, everyone listening, all the rest of you is quote unquote empty space, except as Nikola Tesla and Dr. Professor Dirac and others said, it's not empty space. It's it's a nice. field of infinite energy. And even now, the mainstream physicists are talking about the Higgs field and the Higgs boson and dark energy and dark matter. That's 98 percent of the cosmos that they're now beginning to realize. So, in reality, you know, uh, one uh, generation uh, physics is the next generation's that kind of mythology because it's really changing very rapidly. Absolutely. And this is where I was getting at is that all that, you know, all that if we start to think of space um, defining matter instead of matter defining space, then we start to realize, okay, they might, then the concept of the Big Bang starts to make sense because all of a sudden you can conserve the energy, meaning the energy that produced a Big Bang came from the vacuum or the space prior to the bang. And right. that would mean that there is most likely continuous Big Bangs out there, but that's a whole other story. Um, um, so, so this is where I was coming from from early on. And then I realized that in quantum theory, that had already been found, meaning that like when it's actually in quantum field theory, which is a little extension of quantum theory that was necessary to account for many things we observe at the atomic level. Um, in quantum field theory, when they tried to figure out um, the how to quantize or how to make little packets of energy like the photons for the electromagnetic field when they when they define the photons which involve Einstein and the photoelectric effect and this is actually how he got the Nobel Prize um, you actually have a issue because you end up quantizing the space itself like the vacuum end up quantized and when you when you calculate how much of these little packets of energy are in the space itself at the atomic level, the number is enormous. It's, it's non-trivial. In fact, the first equations in quantum field theory that try to describe the vacuum energy or how much energy is in the vacuum uh, ended up showing that the vacuum would have infinite amount of energy. Right. Then yeah, and so it was non-trivial. They couldn't live with an infinitely dense vacuum, so they um, they tried to find a way to cut the number or renormalize it, and uh, they used the Planck length. The Planck length is a constant. The Planck constant is a constant that that defines the smallest vibration the electromagnetic field can generate, which would be a, a little photon going through itself. Um, and, and that little vibration would be, 
the smallest quanta of the vacuum energy. And when they calculated how many of these little quantas of energy, and I want to say, I want to give you a visual there. It's so small that if I grew a little plunk length so that it was a grain of sand on the end of my little finger, then the proton, which is already teeny little thing in the middle of the atom, would be from here to Alpha Centaurus. So, you know, this little plunk vibration is very, very tiny. When they calculate how many of those there is in a centimeter cube of space, the value is 10 to the 93 grams per centimeter cube, which is like some 30 or 39 orders of magnitude more dense than the whole universe in a centimeter cube of space. So it's really a lot of energy. Yeah, and it's an incredible amount. And that's why uh, experimentally people going back a very long time to the late 1800s using, importantly, various voltages and resonances were mm -hmm. uh, able to observe uh, a so-called increase or excess in energy from some of these mm -hmm. systems. And, of course, it's well thought of now. And, I, in fact, um, it's pretty certain that towards the end of his life, the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works of Ben Rich, uh, and actually this is mentioned in, in the film uh, Sirius um, that, that has just come out, that, that folks can see at SiriusDisclosure.com, in, in that uh, an, an IBM executive who had been at a, a meeting with him said that uh, he said that basically the equations are wrong and that the Maxwell equations um, were originally correct and they got altered. But uh, the, the reality is, is that the electromagnetic field uh, is, uh, can be used to create a vector into what some have called the zero point uh, energy field in the quantum vacuum, where you tap into this incredible amount of energy, where mm -hmm. you're now generating energy not from burning oil or gas or coal or exploding, uh, uh, having fission happen, which is splitting an atom and having a nuclear power plant or a bomb, but you're doing it mm -hmm. by creating a vector uh, through various resonance uh, field frequencies and voltages that uh, create a, a pointing vector and an opening into that uh, volume of space. And we're not talking outer space. We're just talking the space wherever you may be sitting. And that is an right. enormous amount. And, and I, one of the things that most people don't realize also is that this so-called zero-point energy field was described decades ago in the Casimir effect and, and others. Uh, mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, Professor Dirac, uh, and a lot of this information is on our website. It's uh, seriousdisclosure.com if you click on the Orion Project and the New Energy Papers, where they're highly referenced. And, and what's interesting is that, uh, you know, here we are, uh, you know, 120 or 30 years after Maxwell and Faraday and, and uh, for that matter, Tesla in his early work, uh, still, you know, digging up coal and sucking oil out of the ground and burning it. Uh, like Neanderthals, you know, burning something. So it, it's, it's a really a fascinating thing because a lot of these concepts, which sound really futuristic to, to a lot of people, aren't. Uh, they're sort of back to the future in the sense that, um, you know, there have been these sort of breakthroughs and, and evidences and proofs that are in mainstream physics, actually, that have been around for 50 to 100 years. That's right. Uh, actually, the Casimir effect, was I think uh, 1947 or 1948 uh, when um, you know it was um, it was calculated. The thing is, is that they couldn't get the experiment done at the time because they didn't have the technology to get mirrors or or, or plates um, with the precision necessary to to do the test. But I think it was in the late 80s early 90, uh, 90s that um, the first Casimir effect um, experiments were successful and showing exactly what Casimir had calculated in 47, uh, showing that if you created a little bit of a gradient, a little bit of a differential between the energy of the vacuum between two plates very, very close together, 
and the vacuum energy that would be on the outside of the plates, like the long wavelengths of the vacuum, wouldn't be able to get between the plates, so there'd be a difference, a little gradient. Then the plates get pushed together mechanically. So, so we've actually been able to measure mechanical action from the vacuum itself, from what we think of as, as empty space. And then just recently, in the last few years, they've been able to reproduce the plate electronically uh, using squids and, and, and things like that and actually being able to uh, extract microwave photons, literally, you know, photons directly out of the vacuum that way. So we're seeing very significant physical effect from this energy, and we know it's there. At this point, we know it's there. There was a lot of debate about it uh, early on because the number was so large. Most physicists tended to ignore it. In fact, most students in physics were not even aware of this energy potential in the vacuum. Uh, it was typically skipped over in classes. And in, in, in some of the papers I've written, I use this number in the paper, and I, I, you know, I ended up getting hate mail from a bunch of professors out there, professors in physics, <laughs> saying, where did you get that paper? Uh, where did you get that number? You know, uh, uh, it's, it's incorrect, da, 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 da. And I, I would send them the link to the Wikipedia page, you know, and it's like, no, 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 this is a fundamental number necessary in quantum field theory. And actually, it's at the base of, because this vacuum energy potential is actually at the base of um, spontaneous, uh, emission of the electron, so that that is it's necessary for us to be able to describe the mechanisms, the, the the dynamics we see when an electron go from one orbital to the other, and so on. So it it is fundamental to quantum theory and to what we observe. It's not something completely outside of you know science. Uh, as we know it, or physics as we know it. And that may not have been so clear for many researchers out there, just because, as I was saying, the, the norm uh, energy potential um, was so uncomfortable for the scientific community for so long that it was basically put in a closet and forgotten. And, um, and now it's reemerging. Well, it is reemerging, and it's interesting because no physicist uh, today would have a problem understanding that uh, a few kilograms of pluton plutonium uh, compressed together and detonated could um, completely destroy the city of Hiroshima, which happened mm -hmm. in August of 1945. And yet, if to someone, say, 100 years earlier, if you'd shown them a lump of uranium or uh, plutonium or whatever, and said this has enough energy in it to uh, completely uh, level uh, a city like Hiroshima, they would have said you were out of your mind. So, but in this case, it, it's even more fundamental than that, that the studies that have been done on the subatomic level, where they start talking about quarks, and that, that in reality, these uh, subatomic particles that make up the atoms are actually, in a sense, phasing resonantly and flexing in and out of this very potent field. Um, and that all of matter, and in fact space time, is emerging from this sort of field and has a architecture and structure to it. And uh, experimentally, there have been uh, people who have been uh, working in the field of uh, electromagnetic energy for over 100 years who have observed this effect in various ways uh, and unfortunately uh, it always ends up being debunked by people who are saying that well that's not possible because it's violating the second law of thermodynamics and you have to have conservation of energy but what they're right. not remembering is this vast field of energy for which there is empirical proof of existing and so it, there's a disconnect um, and this is, right. you know, very, very strange. And I think that this 
disconnect has been done by, deliberately, quite frankly, by people mm-hmm. who really do not want to acknowledge that, mm-hmm. um, you know, stepping out of this sort of theoretical synthesis mode for a moment, which I know puts people to sleep, but um, uh, talking about the real world out here is that there are what I call the high priest uh, orthodoxy and religious thought, but more mm-hmm. fanatical are the high priest of orthodoxy in scientific temples. Known as <laughs> That's right. And research centers. And, and I know that, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Brian O'Leary, who was trained as an Apollo astronaut, a very dear friend of mine who uh, passed away a couple of years ago, but uh, he and I worked extensively on these issues back in, uh, up until the time of his passing. And uh, here he had, of course, a PhD um, from very prestigious universities uh, and what have you. But he was always being attacked and ridiculed for saying that, look, you can create this effect of generating energy from uh, the so-called vacuum and uh, what you mm-hmm. can describe as zero-point energy field. And it has right. been done. Um, right. And uh, unfortunately, the orthodoxy, uh, I have found in, in, on this issue comes from the rigidity of thought uh, and people sort of ex- believing their own press releases, I guess, and, and that they all know what's happening. But the other right. part of it is that there's a lot of corruption. And, and one of the problems is that a lot of, a lot of people don't realize that uh, uh, back after I briefed uh, a sitting CIA director on the entire uh, UFO issue back in the, in the 90s, I got a, a box of materials from the CIA, and in it was a document that describes uh, how they had engaged this famous astrophysicist and astronomer at Harvard, Dr. Uh, Mintel, uh, who was on the payroll of the CIA to go around and just make outrageously false statements and that none of this could be criminal. And that the same thing was done during the Condon Committee from the University of Colorado from uh, the late 1960s. And we have one of our disclosure witness, witnesses uh, that you can uh, look at his testimony on our site, uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Robert Wood, the PhD, uh, very uh, Cornell guy, uh, worked with uh, McDonald Douglas for years. And he was working on that committee. And when he was putting forth a uh, proof positive of uh, anti-gravity propulsion and that the geophilogics were real, uh, Dr. Condon went directly to old man McDonald of McDonald Douglas Aircraft, which is now part of Boeing, Phantom Works, and tried to get Dr. Woods fired. Now, we have this on videotape testimony, and luckily he had a good enough reputation and relationship with, with the head of McDonald Douglas Aircraft that he did not lose his job. But we found out in this cache of documents that, in fact, Dr. Condon was a consultant to and on the payroll of the C. I, hey, I have it in black and white. And so <laughs> one of the things that I tell people, you do have people who are just tied down and close-minded in science, but you also have these devils who, quite frankly, are carrying water for the status quo of not only uh-huh. science, but the macroeconomic system that has enslaved the world in, in a situation where half the world is living in unbelievable poverty. And we're cannibalizing the biosphere as we go into our now uh, third century of burning fossil fuels to create energy, which is absurd. Right. Well, you know, the good news is that there's more and more people catching on, and there's more and more scientific minds out there that are becoming aware of this possibility, and there's more and more physicists that are you know, starting to understand the dynamics of the vacuum relative to matter and energy and understanding that we're not talking anything about violating laws of conservation. We're just saying that there is another source of energy that was unknown to us that can be accessed. And so there's no violations of of any laws of thermodynamics or even um, conservation, it's just a source of energy that has not been, um, you know, properly understood until, you know, fairly recently in our history. And, so, and that's right, and it was left out of the calculus. So if you leave this entire area of 
energy calculation mm-hmm. out of your equation, then of course mm-hmm. it's going to look like something's coming from nothing. But it isn't mm-hmm. something coming from nothing. It's energy coming from a very well-known and well-described field of energy. Exactly. And actually, as I show in this latest paper I've published, every single atom, every single proton out there that makes up the atoms we see every day is actually most likely tapping into that field. And that's what we call the material world. And so that, you know, these so-called over-unity devices are everywhere around us. We call it the reality we live in. Uh, Correct. This feeding directly on that field, and it's just a question of us understanding those dynamics, how nature does it, and mimicking those dynamics to um, bring our civilization to a place where we become harmonious with the natural world. Right, and one of the things I've always pointed out is that let's let's say you believe in the Big Bang Theory as it's even presented. Well, the original hydrogen atoms that uh, resulted from that uh, event that they now think is uh, in the order of 13 to 15 billion years ago, those atoms are still running. What are they running on? Mm-hmm. Okay, That's what's right. run, okay, what's running the orbit? Uh, and the protons, and the so what is running that? So That's right. you know, uh, so it, it isn't such a uh, we live with it every day. And what's interesting is that when you begin to talk about creating uh, a system that is a, a very high voltage system that uh, is functioning at certain resonance frequencies that opens a vector into this energy field. Um, people say, well, that's not possible. That's why I will point out, yes, it is, and it's been done for many, many decades. The fact that there are um, sociopaths who will do things to confiscate and seize these sorts of breakthroughs. And one of the mm-hmm. things I point out to people who are, who are in the scientific community, this is much less a technical and scientific problem than it is a social and political and microeconomic one. If it was only a technical problem, we would all have been using some of these types of of devices for energy generation and propulsion that have been around for 50 to 100 years, and we're not. Why aren't we? Do they just vanish into thin air? No, they're not. And and one of the things that, uh, you know, we have up on our website is a paper from about two and a half years ago from the Federation of American Scientists, a very mainstream organization that was recently in the news about the uh, National Security Agency programs. Um, and Stephen Aftergood, of that, uh, who heads up their uh, national security um, a branch with the Federation of American Scientists, uh, did a report on the 5,135 uh, patents and devices that had been seized under the provisions of the patent law, and that does not include the thousands that have been seized under the national security orders that never went through the patenting route. And so what you what you begin to realize when you drill down on this is that there are folks out there who have an enormously large vested interest, not only theoretically in physics, but, but more importantly in uh, how the world runs and who runs it and how it's, how it's run, Um, in maintaining the status quo of the current paradigm, which is uh, just an absurd paradigm because the idea that there has been no fundamental breakthroughs in physics and energy generation uh, since uh, Mercedes made the internal combustion engine in the late 1800s or uh, (laughs) cold cold fired uh, steam engines were running around in the mid 1800s for locomotives and uh, even a nuclear power plant as you're splitting the atom you're getting heat. The heat is basically boiling water and creating a steam engine like a choo-choo train in 1849. You're just right. in a steam turbine. And a lot of people think you're getting energy directly from the atom. I said, no, you're not. You're just creating heat. And that That's heat right. turned into a steam generator. And so the right. public have, have, you know, uh, you know, it's sort of ludicrous that, you know, airplanes were 1908 with the Wright brothers and uh, the jet engine is 1930. Uh, rockets, of course, Werner von Braun in the 40s, 
and the atomic energy was the mid-1940s as well. As everyone knows, there at the Trinity site at the White Sands uh, with the Manhattan Project. And do we really believe that in 70 to 100 years there had been no breakthroughs in energy and propulsion? Well, this is mm-hmm. ridiculous. And, and one, one, of the pro- one of the problems I, I always run into is when I deal with someone at the National Science Foundation, or uh, actually yesterday I was speaking to a man who works with all the senior government officials in Australia and, and other countries organizing a, a, a educational programs for them, is that there's this huge gap between what actually is already in existence and has been proven and what even very well-educated people know about, and that gap needs to be closed very quickly if we're going to survive as a Right. Right. And I think part of it is to, you know, for certainly in context of what I'm doing is to establish a theoretical uh, base to understand the uh, dynamics and structure of this vacuum fluctuation so that we have a good understanding of the physics of it. Um, and that gives us a, you know, platform to move into the technological developments and the understanding of even devices that may have been present for, you know, a significant amount of time, as you were just mentioning. I even, you know, think of this uh, agenda coming, going back all the way to the uh, platonic, um, you know, Plato and, and 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 Pythagoras schools were, you know, I, I believe actually Pythagoras uh, was very very close to understanding the dynamics of the vacuum structure um, and the geometry relationship of the resonance frequency and right. uh, the relationship to the geometry even at that time, like some, you know, 400 BC, and so it was, you know. It's been a long time coming, and uh, I think, like, it's really an uh, important time in history right now to be able to make that transition. And it's going to take a lot of help, a lot of effort, and a lot of involvement from the public at large. Yeah, and that's the key thing is the public at large, and that's why what I've been trying to, to organize for a few years is they have to understand that this is a legitimate area of science and energy research, and the support for it that simply is not going to come out of academia and government. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, we had someone put together an ARPA E grant with a lot of excellent uh, reference materials to um, get the Department of Energy to support um, a small grant on research and development into this area, and, and they wouldn't touch it. And and yet, uh, you know, you can come up with every kind of harebrained scheme. I know that the city of San Francisco uh, paid $5 million, over $5 million, just to have someone do a study, not to build anything, but to do a feasibility study for capturing the energy of the tide going in and out of the Golden Gate uh, there, the, the, the narrowing of the bay. Uh, and try to capture that energy through underground uh, mechanical systems that would turn that into electrical energy generation. And the study mm-hmm. alone paid for by this one relatively small city. I mean, the city of San Francisco only has 750,000 people in the city limits. They spent $5 million just on that. And, and right. so what you begin to realize is that what we're wanting to do, where you know, we have announced that, that we're, we're wanting to build a research and development center for serious technology and research here, and our budget is about $6.3 million. and yet there aren't any um, foundations or organizations or government entities that, 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 that to date have wanted to fund that kind of research, and so at a certain point, either the public is going to have to step up to the plate on that, or it, it may be too long of a period coming. Uh, my concern is the, the, what they call the event horizon, um, and that is that uh, looking at the Earth as an organic system in Gaia as a self-correcting conscious being, um, I don't think she's going to permit uh, the human race to completely cannibalize and destroy her oceans, environment, uh, land, air, and what have you, 
forever um, because we're wanting to elect a corrupt uh, oligarchy um, mm-hmm. and a bunch of bureaucrats um, keep this sort of technology and information from the public because, you know, at a certain point, uh, the earth is too precious to allow one or two generations of um, sociopathic leaders to destroy. And <laughs> I think, you know, I, I think that there is, um, you know, there, you know, it, it is TikTok. And I, I, I'm afraid that, um, you know, incrementalism, uh, recreating the wheel uh, over and over again, whether it's theoretical or not, when there are uh, practical electromagnetic um, uh, theories and devices that have been around for a very long time, creating this mm-hmm. effect of what mm-hmm. we call over unity, um, is something that uh, can't be allowed to continue to just be on the back burner. It's got to be moved to the front right. burner uh, as quickly as we can, because uh, being an emergency doctor, one thing I always tell people, I know an emergency when I see one, and this planet <laughs> is in an emergency. And, no doubt. Yeah, and I think, you know, you can kind of hide away someplace that's beautiful and think everything is fine, but as you travel the world and you see 7 billion people. When I was talking to this, this man in Australia about that their biggest export for Australia is commodities and coal to China. And China is hmm. now getting uh, 82% of their electricity from burning uh, dirty coal uh, without any scrubbers, and India is around 80%. Right. So you look at, you know, there's two and a half billion people trying to have electricity by burning the dirtiest coal without any scrubbers like we have in America and Europe, uh, right. just like we were in the 1800s. Well, this is a, a very non-sustainable and backward way of civilization trying to advance. Yeah, and it's not going to go away, and it's not going to get better. I mean, more and more... Countries, you know, uh, from the third world is going to have more and more power, you know, have the two-car garage and, you know, the white picket fence. And it's, you know, it's going to, they're going to demand more and more uh, energy, um, air conditioning systems and so on. And, you know, so we have to find a solution and the solution cannot be you know, at this point, anything like uh, what, what in one way is a little frustrating as well is when you start to talk about alternative energy, start, people start talking about solar panels and, <laughs> right. uh, and windmills and, and all this stuff and um, wind generators and so on, and as if it was cutting edge technology. And it, it really isn't. And it's not going to do the job. Um, we really need to go to a whole other level. And that whole other level implies as well, you know, advanced uh, gravitational technologies and so on. Because if you think of it, and I know, you know, you can extrapolate your vision to that level um, from what you do. Uh, you think If you think of it, uh, universally, if you think of civilizations in the universe out there, let's say any other planet out there with people on it, no matter how big the planet is, no matter how much resources there is there, eventually uh, the people that live there are going to have to be able to move past their planetary body. They're going to have to expand past uh, the surface of their planet because um, resources on the surface are limited. Planets are unstable. Even Stephen um, Hawking, you know, in the last few years have talked about that publicly, that we need to expand past our planet. It, it's like a planet is a little nest, like uh, of a bird, you know, and and where the little baby birds in, on in the nest. Well, eventually there's too many little birds and they're getting too big, and you know they got to learn to fly and and get out of the nest before there's a big you know wind that throws the nest to the ground. And I think we've been floating in grace for a very long time. Our planet has been quite stable for a long time. 
we know, for instance, we're we're way overdue for for a, um, a pole shift on our planet. We know they occur very um, methodically, and and right. that. Um, there's all sorts of things that can happen. Uh, one good sun flare directed at our planet, and zip, the atmosphere could go. Uh, one, you know, few mile long meteorite hitting the planet. All sorts of things that could have devastated, devastating uh, result on our civilization can occur. So we ultimately, whether we're polluting or not, or, you know, whether we're doing what we're doing or not, we have to rise to a higher level of interaction with the universe as a whole and understanding of its dynamics. And the understanding of this vacuum energy, the fundamental energy at the source of creation, at the source of matter creation, leads as well to an understanding of mass, and electromagnetism in which we can clearly have a path of engineering to be able to control gravitational fields, produce, you know, uh, levitation engines and so on to actually bring our civilization to a space civilization um, and, and, and give the Earth back to the Earth, bring the Earth back into its state of garden um, and, and so that when we come on the surface, the surface is in a pristine state. And that could happen very quick, quickly. I always remind people some years ago there was a massive power outage in the northeastern United States due to our creaky grid system that collapsed. And the satellite images of that area around New York, New Jersey, all the way over to Ohio, the air became so clear. It became it was unbelievable the before and after satellite images. And that was just, mm-hmm. you know, a certain number of hours. So the Earth has the ability to uh, be restored and to heal right. uh, if we quit abusing her. Uh, and so I think this becomes really uh, one of the great challenges of our time. And uh, you, you mentioned the, the uh, what I call electromagnetic gravitic effect and, and the so-called gravity control. But, uh, you know, I have a... a someone I've worked with for many years who's, who's stayed at my home and, and who is the third highest ranking scientist at the largest Department of Defense lab uh, in the United States, uh, the Naval Research Labs. And he says, oh, yes, he's been involved in gravity control, and all of that was mastered and figured out in October of 1954. And if you look at the, the work of Keith Townsend Brown and others in the Kolosky Frost experiment in the 20s and 30s and 40s, there's a lot of work and the big buzz in the aerospace industry. Uh, and I know this because my, uh, my uncle, who um, was a senior project uh, engineer for the lunar module um, when we went to the moon, uh, had seen in the journals back in the late 40s and early 50s all this talk about gravity and high-voltage systems and the ability to create a certain voltages and under certain conditions where you have in a sense, a, a, a mass neutralization effect where things do lift and levitate. Mm-hmm. And that was mm-hmm. actually in the open literature. Many people don't realize that was in the mainstream aerospace uh, journals uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, and then the lid was slammed down on it, and it all went black. Uh, mm-hmm. And so uh, what's interesting is that a lot of, you know, you look at the old cartoons like George Jetson floating around in these things, <laughs> well, I, you know, when those cartoons came out, the reality is we already had them in classified programs. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, one of the senior science guys at the CIA is a man I know very well, and we've talked about this. And, and uh, one of the one of the, the, the really crazy things about our society is that uh, these ideas um, are not just in the theoretical realm. Um, you know, the laws of the universe are universal. And not only have other civilizations that found them and have been able to travel transdimensionally beyond the speed of light by dropping out of linear space-time, that's another whole discussion, and arriving here, that's how the ET civilizations do go through interstellar distances. But mm-hmm. we have experimented with this sort of technology. And in the movie Sirius, you know, this, this, uh, this man that uh, uh, has uh, had met the uh, Ben Rich, the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, super secret Lockheed Martin operation.
operations up in the high desert of California. I said that Ben Rich, in his um, presentation, showed this disc shooting off in the space. It was one of ours. And he said, we, and then afterwards, in, in some discussions, he says, we already have the technology to take ET home, meaning interstellar. But, of course, all these classified technologies, uh, uh, which we pay for, I mean, this is where when, when Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense for George W. Bush, said there's $2.3 trillion that uh, is unaccounted for in the Department of Defense budget over the last number of years, uh, this is where it's gone. And so we, we need sort of a piece dividend where the science and technology and, and energy uh, systems that have already been studied so that we don't have to start at zero and recreate the wheel because in reality there's been a hundred years of, of uh, people who have done some very elegant work in high energy physics and in electromagnetic uh, field studies and uh, high voltage resonant fields that create this uh, over unity effect for energy generation and gravity uh, control that, that's been done. And, and here we are as still living sort of almost like cavemen uh, relative to where we should be. And, and this, right. is, this is the hard thing for people to understand. I know that so many people I meet with, uh, today I'm in Washington, D.C., um, and, and, you know, I meet with so many people who have no knowledge of this that it sounds terribly futuristic and unbelievable. Right. And, and, and I just tell people that it's only futuristic because it's been deliberately kept hidden. But it doesn't mean at all that it's, it's something new and that it, it, it's really been around for quite some time. Yeah, I always give the example to people about, you know, if you went to that region where the Wright brothers flew the first plane just before they did so and told people there, well, you know, these guys are going to show up with this huge device that has, like, motors on it and all this. And just by pushing the air over the wings, uh, the wings of that device, uh, the lift of the air is going to actually bring the whole thing up in the air. Um, you know, the people there would have thought I was crazy and I couldn't be right. done. And in fact, at the time, there was multiple, there was a, a flurry of uh, papers published in physics in peer-reviewed journals all around the world demonstrating unequivocally, uh, mathematically, that such a thing could not be done. Um, and, you know, and it actually took some three years before the physics community stopped saying that the Wright brothers um, device was a, was a hoax uh, right. after they've done the first, they had done the first flight. So it really, you know, changed things very dramatically um, when it occurred. And it's really something similar that we are on the verge of at this point where something that seemed that it could not be done or that it would be very, very far in the future um, could occur, in fact, will occur, uh, I believe, uh, very shortly and, um, and is going to change our world and the way we interact with it, the way we think of ourselves even in the world. Because... Right. As I show in this latest paper, this this vacuum fluctuation structure uh, of of, uh, of space time itself is the boundary condition that produced the atomic structure. Meaning that it's not like atoms or protons or particles are like a, a billiard ball um, isolated. It's actually a, a basically a, a dynamic of the vacuum in that region itself. It's a fluctuation of little Planck structures spinning together, creating this little knot in space that we think of as a particle. And, right. you know, and if that's, and, and if that's true, and, and, you know, the paper makes predictions that just got measured, that are extremely accurate and so on, so there's lots of evidence that it's correct, um, then all the information that you're made of is actually a, a, a 
uh, true port or a, a connection to this energy vacuum fluctuation. So even the fact that biology eventually leads to self-aware beings like us, is an emergence of the information network that's occurring at the vacuum structure level. And so our understanding of ourself in the universe fundamentally changes, and the technology we use um, brings us to a whole new level of interaction. Well, and that's ultimately this, all of this area of physics are leading to um, what uh, Kaswami and others have talked about, the self-aware universe or uh, the, the quantum conscious hologram that is uh, the cosmos. And I know that, uh, you know, I knew Dr. John at Princeton, uh, who was the professor emeritus who did the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, where he showed that uh, people putting their thought and awareness uh, in an intent and directed way on random number generators could alter the outcome of those random number generators and studies have been mm-hmm. done on, on with photons where consciousness mm-hmm. and thought and you begin to realize that conscious field mind itself as well as Erwin Schrodinger said that as a total number of minds in the cosmos is one it's a singularity and mm-hmm. that in reality every individual is, a, is sort of an aperture an opening uh, mm-hmm. in that unbounded mind and uh, this is why for example remote viewing does work and Mm -hmm. uh, our contact protocol five initiative where we train people in meditation or remote viewing and using coherent thoughts to make contact with interstellar trans-dimensional civilizations does work the reason Mm -hmm. it does is that consciousness is in a sense the ultimate uh, unified field and mm-hmm. it's uh, in a non-local field. It's not uh, mm-hmm. contained and limited by space, time, linearity, but is uh, the epitome of non-locality. And, right. Uh, and and you so know, that is, yeah. to me, what's really quite fascinating is that this whole area of physics that deal with energy generation and mm-hmm. gravity control and interstellar and transdimensional travel begins to also emerge into this concept of awareness and mind. And <laughs> what's been known in the Vedas and other ancient teachings for thousands of years, and that is that the conscious mind within every single individual is in reality a singularity that's not visible and is omnipresent. Right. You know, this never got so clear for me when I started to, you know, um, to... Uh, calculate the amount of this energy fluctuation of the information in the vacuum uh, inside the event horizon or the the surface of a proton. Like I was calculating how much of these little fluctuation Planck oscillators were present inside a proton and calculating their mass in terms of energy due to E equals mc squared. And when I made the calculation, it came out um, 10 to the 55 grams, which just happens to be the mass of the universe. It completely blew my mind um, because it actually clearly demonstrated that in terms of information, vacuum fluctuation inside the proton, all other protons in the universe are represented in each and every proton, meaning that all of them are part of this network um, Planck wormhole uh, grid or uh, structure that makes up our universe where information flow holographically through the whole system to create what we call mass, energy, gravity, and so on. And it showed me that uh, the system is completely interactive with itself. And right. it, it, it's, it's a remarkable thing. And when I, and, and you think, wow, you know, this is, this is unreasonable. You know, he's, he's talking about all the information in the universe inside a proton. 
But the fact is, is that using those equations, then I was able to show that the interaction of the information produced the exact mass of the proton, the exact radius of the proton, the exact gravitational field, the confining force. I mean, it started to explain many, many things in physics and um, very, very accurately. So, you know, it's very, very convincing that this is actually how it works. It is a network of information across the whole thing. Uh, and, and so it, it starts to, as you were saying, being able to explain, like, why could you be able to remote view a location that's hundreds or thousands of miles away from you? Well, if all the information is present in every point in space, then right. and you're part of this structure, then you should be able to access that. And all of a sudden, we have a mechanism to explain these phenomenons so that they're not just like some odd things that occurs or some paranormal thing. They're actually normal things due to the way the physics and the universe itself works. Right, and this is another point that, uh, you know, every point in space and time is immediately connected to every other point in space in, in, mm -hmm. in the universe uh, and, and, and any other point in space and time through this non-local organizing effect of mm -hmm. consciousness. And that's something that has actually been proven and shown experimentally. And mm -hmm. uh, it explains many of the things. And I agree with you very much. I, I, I really abhor the term paranormal. There's nothing para about it. it it's mm -hmm. very normal. And right. uh, I was talking to a, uh, a man that I know who did a ethnography of the um, fleet time uh, experience of the aboriginals of Australia. And, and mm -hmm. he was telling me how uh, for the people who were in that culture and, and had not been uh, overly westernized, it was completely normal to be able to be in a, a meditative or in, in the dream state and to see remote places and converse with people. And, and they didn't have this idea that linearity was the only thing that existed, that there was, yes, there's space and there's time, and you do walk 10 miles when you walk 10 miles. However, right. that on another and, and, and ongoing and concomitant level, at the same instant, there is this perfect um, state of balance that's integrated that is non-locality and mm -hmm. is conscious and where information mm -hmm. and connectivity is complete and whole. And that explains so many of these um, experiences and phenomena, but it also begins to ex explain interstellar communication devices. It begins to explain how you might go from one star system to another. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, ben, Rich, ben Rich himself uh, said to one of our witnesses that um, every point in space and time is connected to every other by mind consciousness. And this is this was a very hardcore. Uh, aerospace guy, and he was sharing this stuff near the end of his life. But uh, what's fascinating is that this is, to me, the exciting education and knowledge that, that will be coming forward to our people and on this planet in, in the coming years and decades. And right. much of it was known a very long time ago. I point out to people that where my country home is in um, Virginia, which is near Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, uh, I can see from my house the Swannanoa where um, Walter, Dr. Walter Russell was, uh, who had mentored right. um, uh, Nikola Tesla, uh, had his Wananoa Institute and uh, over 100 years ago. And he wrote a book called The Universal One, where these concepts were. And, and so I, I point out to people that whether you're talking that era or the ancient Vedas, and, and there's a wonderful Sufi saying that says, think is thyself a puny form when within the, the universe is folded? Uh, and it's a rhetorical question, but um, that in fact within each of us and within all things and all places, the entirety of the cosmos is actually enfolded and through non-locality and consciousness mm -hmm. is accessible and mm -hmm. can be um, experienced. Uh, right. It's, it's a fantastic uh, realization. Uh, so it's sort of uh, enlightened physics as I look at it. Right. Uh, and, you know, for people out there, uh, you know, it's not only in the context of 
alternative research or experiment that we find these things. For instance, the Bell experiment and entanglement have been there for a very long time in standard physics, showing that, um, you know, Einstein called it spooky action at a distance, showing that you can have two photons uh, hundreds and thousands or across the universe from each other. And, and if you change the polarity of one of the photon, um, if they came out of the same atom, uh, the other one will change its polarity to match uh, the polarization change that you made on the initial photon. It doesn't matter how far it is from uh, the coordinates of, of the photon you're modifying. And so there is very, very, and these experiments have been verified uh, multiple, multiple times and so on. So it, 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 it's there, we know it's there, and it's just not being put in the context of a whole overarching understanding of the dynamics of the universe and creation and gravitation and mass and so on. Um, snippets are there, and it's like a puzzle that has not been put together yet. Like many of the pieces are already there, and they're there in ancient civilization. They're there in more modern uh, times. Um, they're there in the physics and the chemistry, in the social studies, um, and so on. And when you start putting the the puzzle together, this incredible picture emerge, and and it's telling us that the universe is highly connected, and that that everything cr is created with high level of coherency. You can see it in the biological evolution. You can see the incredible complexity and coherency that emerge from you know, from material like uh, like fundamental fluids like water and 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 minerals uh, and so on. And all of a sudden, you have these highly complex systems that emerge, uh, self-organizing, uh, that demands that there is a, a fundamental structure behind it, this fundamental feedback mechanism, so that the system learns about itself and is able to grow and go into deeper and deeper level of complexity and advancements. And, right. and at the, right. it's an amazing thing. Um, it's remarkable. And it all works together. And this is one thing we have a tendency to do in science is that we separate fields of expertise and we put them in boxes. And typically these fields, don't talk to each other very well, and so the picture is fragmented and the pieces of the puzzle stay separated. And this is the time where we have to put them together to transform our understanding. Yeah, it is the time of coming together. Well, our mm -hmm. time is up. as It's gone by so quickly, and I really appreciate <laughs> your, your sharing your perspective and knowledge and wisdom on this and that theme. Um, if you want to, would you like to give people a website where people can see what you're doing and learn about Absolutely. your work? Absolutely. Yes, uh, people can go to the resonance.is. Resonance is. Um, uh, it's our brand new website. We've actually made some updates last week uh, or a few days ago, and um, they can get my papers there, and they can look at a trailer of a movie that's being made about the information that I'm bringing forward. And uh, as well, there is the Institute, uh, the Hawaii Institute for Unified Physics, highup.org, where people that are more scientifically based that wants to have more of the um, information, the scientific information can go to. So both websites, uh, resonance.is and highup Dot org are places where people can go and get all sorts of information and participate in uh, programs and become members of the foundation and help us continue to do research. Well, thank you so much. And for those of you wanting to see the film Sirius can do so at SiriusDisclosure.com. The DVD is also available now at the website. And um, uh, look forward to 
uh, speaking with all of you again in uh, another two weeks. And I'd like to thank the, the great people at the World Fusion Network for uh, hosting us here every two weeks. And again, Nassim, thank you so much for being here with me today. I appreciate very much you having me, and I look forward to the next time. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.